People in Argentina celebrate the integration of President Alberto Fernández. The search continues for a Chilean military plane that went missing with 38 passengers late on Monday. And protests are held outside the International Court of Justice as hearings start in the genocide case against Myanmar. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. Today we start in Argentina, where tens of thousands gathered outside the presidential palace to celebrate the inauguration of Alberto Fernández as president. These are live images from Buenos Aires, where a concert is being held as citizens hail the start of a new era for Argentina. Many have also expressed joy at the end of Mauricio Macri's time in power, a period that left the country dealing with runaway inflation, a colossal debt with the IMF, and over 40% of citizens living under the poverty line. As the festivities took place outside, inside the palace, a new president swore in, 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 in his cabinet of ministers. They'll have the difficult task of trying to restart the country's economy and deal with the problems of mounting hunger, unemployment, and falling production. Our correspondent, Sabrina Roth, is with the people celebrating outside the presidential palace in Buenos Aires in the Plaza de Mayo, which is packed with people who have come to celebrate this change of government on the Day of Democracy, the anniversary of the end of the dictatorship. What you can see on people's face here is real joy, a return of hope after four years that have been very difficult for millions of Argentinians. Young people who see that politics are back as a means for changing society. That is what they saw in the inaugural speech of Alberto Fernández, which had a powerful political message with concrete measures to tackle the big problems facing Argentina today. Those include poverty, hunger and unemployment. There is really a party atmosphere here. And we expect that to go on into the night when President Alberto Fernández will come out to speak to the people. The barriers that in recent times separated the square from the presidential palace have been taken down. That was something Alberto Fernández particularly asked for. So the party will continue as people celebrate the end of the neoliberal cycle here in Argentina. Earlier in the day, Alberto Fernández took the oath of office in the nation's Congress. Yo, Alberto Ángel Fernández, I, Alberto Ángel Fernández, swear by God, by my country and on the Holy Gospel to fulfill with loyalty and patriotism the role of President of the nation and to obey and have obeyed the Constitution of Argentina. If I fail, may God and my country judge me. Fernandez took the oath before a packed Congress in Buenos Aires. He was accompanied by the new Vice President and former President, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. The two have promised a new era in Argentina. Yo, Cristina I, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, swear by God, by my country, and on the Holy Gospel to fulfill with loyalty and patriotism the role of Vice President of the nation and to obey and have obeyed faithfully the Constitution of Argentina. If I fail, may God, my country, and the people judge me. Thank you. After being sworn in, Alberto Fernandez received the presidential sash from the outgoing president and proceeded to sign the act of secession. In his inaugural address, Argentina's new leader reminded people that the 10th of December is the anniversary of the end of a cruel dictatorship 37 years ago. He promised to put social justice at the center of a new social contract in Argentina. On the basis of the hope that millions of Argentinians expressed at the ballot box on the 27th of October, I come to urge the unity of all Argentina in order to build a new contract among citizens. A social contract that expresses fraternity and solidarity. Fraternity because it is time to embrace differences. Solidarity because in this social emergency it is time to begin with those who are last in order eventually to reach everyone. This is the spirit of the era that we are now beginning. 
with sober words and audacious actions. I call on everyone without distinction to put Argentina on its feet so it can begin to walk step by step with dignity on the path towards development with social justice. Today it is more necessary than ever to set Argentina back on its feet so that it can move forward. And that means above all restoring a series of balances in our society and economy which today do not exist. It is time to overcome lethargy, to be aware of the deep wounds we now suffer and which, in order to be cured, need time, tranquility and above all, humanity. Bolivia's the post-president Evo Morales has welcomed the arrival of Alberto Fernandez to the presidency of Argentina. In a tweet, Morales said, Today, hope has returned to our sister Republic of Argentina with Alberto and Cristina. We congratulate this valiant people who are raising the flag of integration in our Latin America. Ecuador's former president Rafael Correa was one of the Latin American leaders present for the swearing-in of Alberto Fernandez. He got the same welcome from the new president of Argentina as other serving leaders. Well, on an official visit in Argentina, Cuba's president Miguel Díaz-Canel attended a solidarity act at the University of Buenos Aires. Díaz-Canel condemned the coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia and the persecution of both former Brazilian president Lula da Silva and Cristina Fernández de Kirchner in Argentina. During his visit, he also held a working breakfast with business owners with the objective of boosting bilateral trade. At the solidarity event, he praised the Argentine left for for ushering in the new area of progressive change. Made imperialists and oligarchy now, there is no force in the world which can separate our peoples. There is no force in this world that can separate Cuba and Argentina. You confirm the triumph of the popular movements and campesinos, unions, political forces, students and women's organizations, as well as groups of intellectuals. A military plane carrying 38 passengers has gone missing in Chile. Authorities say that in-depth investigation is underway as the rescue planes and ships search the open sea between the southern tip of South America and Antarctica. The Air Force said the Hercules aircraft was headed to the Antarctic Air Base on Monday afternoon when it lost communication. At the start of a new week of anti-government mobilizations in Chile, social organizations occupied Santiago's downtown to demand answers to requests sent weeks ago to President Sebastián Piñera. On Monday, Chilean senators put a stop to punitive measures by the government, which sought to punish those who participate on social protests. For lawmakers, the project was poorly formulated and its sanctions too high. We reject the entire first article of the so-called anti-looting law because it criminalizes social protests, it criminalizes the Mapuche people and their struggle. The article is evil. In the morning, social organizations set up tents in a public square in Santiago. If the law in question were to be approved, such actions could be severely punished. Right now the main stage is being set up, a place for public debate, so that Chilean citizens can come and give their opinion and discuss and build the new country we want. We have come to defend our sovereignty, to demand to be heard and to get answers. We're calling on all workers to keep on mobilizing and to take our demands to all public spaces. They demand justice, reparations and also want to take part in the process of drafting a new constitution that includes reforms to the pensions and health care systems as well as an increase to the minimum wage. It's not just these 50 days. Social organizations have been asking for this a long time. In this country, there is no real democracy because there are no social rights. I think it's very serious when you see a government that instead of promoting laws to improve social conditions, criminalizes its own people, and at the same time it keeps systematically violating our human rights. Protesters say these mobilizations will go on indefinitely until the government meets their demands. Coming up, Antigua and Barbuda denounces the embargo imposed on Cuba by the U.S. Stay with us. Welcome back to Promise 
Venezuela was among the many nations participating in the United Nations Conference on Climate Change, COP25. The delegation was headed by Foreign Minister Jorge Raza. Professor Karl Marx had already warned of it. Back in 1992, the commander president, Fidel Castro, said that there was an endangered species, and that species was the human one. We can say 27 years later that the human species is still in danger of extinction. Allow me also to recall the words that Commander Hugo Chavez took from the streets of Denmark in the demonstrations against the Conference on Climate Change 10 years ago. And although they tried to not give the floor to him, or the worthy president Evo Morales of Bolivia, Hugo Chavez said, let's not change the climate, let's change the system, and consequently begin to save the planet. For Venezuela, it is fundamental that the international community renew its commitment to multilateralism and international law in all areas, especially in the climate area. But we shouldn't talk about the climate crisis, but rather of an emergency. We should call it by its name, which is almost a catastrophe, and we need to stop it immediately. Also speaking at the COP25 conference, Barbados reflected on the catastrophic damage caused by hurricanes on Caribbean countries over the years, most recently in the Bahamas. With this in mind, the Barbados representative calls for immediate action, noting that the island will implement its own policies to tackle climate change. The government intends to enhance the resilience of low- and middle-income households to, extre to extreme weather events. In concert with this adaptation measure, with these um, adaptation measures, and despite being only a minimal contribution to the global greenhouse gas emissions, the government of Barbados remain committed to doing its fair share to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, as articulated in the Barbados National Energy Policy, we will seek to transform Barbados from a petroleum-based economy to a first green 100% renewable energy and carbon neutral island state by the year 2030. And Tiwan Rabuda's Foreign Affairs Minister E. P. Shed Green has announced the embargo impo imposed on Cuba by the United States as he observed CARICOM Cuba Day. Monday marked 47 years since the establishment of diplomatic relations between CARICOM member states and the Republic of Cuba. In a small ceremony held on Friday, Green said, We CARICOM countries continue to reiterate our call for an end to the economic, commercial and financial blockade Posed by the U.S. government against Cuba. We condemn the current U.S. administration's decision to tighten sanctions against our Caribbean sister island of Cuba. UNICEF has released a report noting that more than 750,000 children have been displaced by storms and flooding across the Caribbean in the last four years. This is a six-fold increase compared to that 175,000 in the preceding four-year period from 2009 to 2013. UNICEF's Child Alert Series, Children Uprooted in the Caribbean, How Stronger Hurricanes Linked to a Changing Climate Are Dry child displacement found that the primary cause was a series of catastrophic tropical cyclones or hurricanes that hit the region between 2016 and 2018. More than 400,000 children in the Caribbean were displaced by hurricanes during 2017 alone. Trinidad and Tobago is moving to demotinize its 100 uh, a bill, $100 million bill by December 31st, replacing it with a polymeter note. This has led to long lines at banks across the island since nationals are scampering to make the change within 14 days. Some businesses have already stopped accepting the old note. This decision came after the government determined that the previous $100 bill had been used in nefarious activities, including money laundering, counterfeiting, and drug deals. The Mexican government announced it has managed to stop the drop in oil production as well as the discovery of a new oil field in the southeast of the country. Let's take a closer look.
The head of Mexican state oil company, Pemex, announced that the nation has managed to revert the drop in oil production that had been ongoing during previous administrations. They hope to close out the year with a rebound. In December, new oil fields will start production. You may remember we had said that 20 new fields were ready to be exploited. According to official data, by January of 2019, production stood at 1,625,000 barrels per day, the lowest production in 20 years. But over the past 12 months, production increased by 100,000 barrels per day. According to the president, this is a result of stopping privatization. Over the last few years of the neoliberal rule, public investment was going to oil fields in the north and in the deep sea, where there is either no oil or extracting proofs too expensive. Investment in the southeast and in shallow waters where oil is present was insufficient. During a recent trip to the state of Tabasco, the president was informed about the discovery of an oil field holding up to 500 million barrels of oil. The discovery was made close to where a new refinery is being built. We will produce gasoline, something we haven't done in the last 40 years. Previous governments would only sell crude oil. With this discovery, the current government hopes to increase their proven oil reserves. Also, among the natural resources they hope to exploit is lithium. They say we could have the world's largest lithium deposit. But it all depends on worldwide lithium production, because one thing is to have the biggest deposit and another is to be the largest producer. The first information provided by the Undersecretary of Mining about the Baca de Huachi deposit in the state of Sonora said it is not yet clear how large the lithium reserves are, but initial production could reach over 17,000 tons. The English-speaking community in Cameroon is said to be granted special status of their region. The Cameroonian National Assembly is debating a bill aimed at granting special status to the Anglophone region. English-speaking Cameroonians have faced ethnic conflicts and they have pinned their homes on the bill to bring about peace in their region. The bill debate came after a national dialogue was held to try and bring solutions to the Anglophone crisis. I think that for a special status, the government must react very quickly. The government must make this a priority. But the way it does things, I don't think it's their priority. Their priority is the elections they announced for February 9. Mining companies have reduced or shut down operations in South Africa after the country's only power supplier, ESCOM, announced they would roll out power cuts. It said the national power grid has no capacity to keep the lights on. Our correspondent, Matua Malachi, has more on the electricity crisis. It looks like South Africa's economy is headed for a recession and that's according to economists and experts who are observing the developments in the country and the biggest development now is the power cuts that have been happening more frequently and for much longer. South Africa's only power utility, ESCOM, which is also a state-owned company, says it can't keep the lights on as usual because now it's been introducing what it calls stages in load shedding um, uh, load shedding is something that happens the power cuts that happen rotationally around the country and so now we've had stage two and stage four of load shedding so far by ESCOM but now on Monday we've seen something that we've never seen before which was stage six load shedding which is rotational power cuts much longer and more frequent so it means South Africa South Africans will have less electricity at least 50% of electricity in 24 hours that that's that's what that's what stage 6 load shedding means according to ESCOM and now South African government has reacted to this development with a mere apology South, the South African government at this point can offer more than an apology it has apologized to South Africans for the major inconvenience that has come with this load shedding that's been introduced by the power utility and the power utility is defending its stance saying this is the only way it can keep the power grid on if it has rotational power cuts around the country if not it will have a total shutdown of the power grid which is something that the economy does not need at this point but already the economy is being affected negatively by these power cuts by ESCOM because ESCOM is one of the biggest economic drivers but now the economy is going to be hurt by this power cuts that we see now and 
that's not helping as much as South Africa because Moody's ratings agency is keeping an eye on South Africa and is supposed to make a pronouncement in February to decide whether where it stands actually with the country. But economists and experts, as I've told you, say we are heading for a recession if ESCOM does not change the way it's doing things so far. And the change at ESCOM is not something we're going to see anytime soon because as I said, South Africa, the only thing that South, the South African government could offer was an apology and hope for the best. And it's not helping that this weather we've had for almost a week now has been persistent and also causing major destruction. And uh, rescue operations by emergency services is, is a bit slower than usual when, when we have electricity. But for, for now, South Africa is going to end the year at a very, very difficult note. And it, it, if we can only live in hope that President Sol Ramaphosa can steer this ship before it hits the proverbial iceberg, as many predict. It's back to your studio. We thank Matuba for that report. Coming up after the break, people in Iraq vow to continue to protest until their demands are met. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Protesters gathered outside the UN's Court of Justice in The Hague as hearings started in the genocide case initiated by the Gambian government against Myanmar. 30 members of the European Rohingya Council and the, and the Myanmar Muslim Association in Netherlands carried banners as a show of solidarity. This while Gambia's lawyers read witness accounts detailing killings of Rohingya Muslims. Myanmar had previously denied the allegations made by refugees who fled to neighboring Bangladesh against its troops, including of mass rape, killings, and arson. We are like a slave. We are slave of the Bama. So we are, that's why, so I came here to support. I am a Rohingya. I support to my people because we are many suffering since long time. We have, uh, we have many history. Turkey has announced that it is now ready to send troops to Libya to maintain peace if requested by the internationally recognized government in Tripoli. The Turkish president made the announcement following an agreement signed with Libya's government of national accord led by Prime Minister Fayez al-Sarrah last month. If Libya makes such a request from us, in such a case we can send our personnel there at the necessary level, especially after striking the military security agreement. Protesters in Iraq have vowed to keep a pressure on the government until their demands are met. The protesters gathered once again in Al Tahrir Square in Baghdad despite efforts by security forces to stop the demonstrations in the past days. Hundreds of people have been killed since anti-government demonstrations began. We will remain peaceful in this place and not move. The state has to find a solution. We will not leave and not cross the line that was put between us. The Lebanese security forces has clashed with protesters in the northern city of Tripoli as they took protests to homes of politicians and targeted government buildings. The Lebanese army fired tear gas to disperse protesters as they marched to politicians' homes, dumping rubbish outside their doors. The angry protesters also attacked municipality headquarters in Tripoli, mashing windows and setting a room on fire. The protests, which started in October, were triggered by austerity measures put in place by the government, corruption and unemployment. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesforenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Stefania Bravo. Until next time.